Good afternoon. Okay, we are here gathered today at this time, at this hour, to listen to none other than Professor Patrick Locke Otieno Lumumba. Professor Lumumba was born at this institute in Kenya and he went to school. He holds a Bachelor of Law's degree and a Master's of Law's degree from the University of Nairobi and the, a, doctor, a Doctor of Law's degree from the University of Ghent in Belgium as well as a Doctor of Degree and Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. He's trained on human rights at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, the University of London, in England. He's trained in humanitarian law at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of the University of Lund in Sweden, and on international humanitarian law in Geneva, Switzerland. He's a fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya, a member of the Kenya Institute of Management, and a certified mediator. Professor Mumba is an eloquent legal practitioner and an advocate of the High Courts of Kenya and Tanzania. He has received many local and international prestigious recognition and awards. He was director and chief executive officer of the Kenya School of Law until 2017. And he has been a founder chairman and member of different local and international commissions, tr trusts, and boards. He is married with two daughters. So ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, it's my pleasure and honor to present to you Professor Patrick Clark Otieno Lumumba. Karibu san. Let me start by saying how glad I am to once again uh, stand before you in this famous hall named after Ghana's Osagiefo Kwame Nukuruma. I'm also glad uh, that I'm here on an occasion to once again remember one of the greatest sons of Africa, Mwarimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. And I'm happy that I'm doing this in the presence of distinguished Africans and a sprinkling of individuals from other civilizations. It gladdens my heart that every year this university takes time to bring together men and women to think about the evergreen subject of African unity. Exactly 56 years ago, on the 24th day of May, 1963, there was a meeting such as this in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And many of you who were alive then and those who are not alive courtesy of history will remember that one of the great themes of that meeting was African unity. Present at that meeting were 32 heads of states and governments of the then independent African countries. And if one were to read or to listen to the speeches that were delivered on that day, one could discern a common thread. Tanzania's Kambarage Nyerere 
said on that day, among others, that we have not come here to remind ourselves how important unity is. We know that unity is at the very heart of the future of the continent of Africa. Even some of the leaders who subsequently did not serve Africa well thought well on that day. So that even individuals such as David Dako of Central African Republic thought that unity was a good thing. And many of them were as eloquent as they were unanimous in recognizing that unity was critical to the survival of the continent. But the most eloquent and indeed the most celebrated speech of the day was one that was delivered not only with passion, but with a sense of urgency. It was the speech of Ghana's Kwame Nukuruma. He reminded his audience on that day that it was right to celebrate the independence that had been regained. But he did not stop there. He reminded them that having regained independence, they should not rest on their laurels because Africa and African countries had regained independence at a time when imperialism was in the ascendancy. And he reminded them that the imperialism that they were confronting was mature imperialism that was subtle and subterranean in our ways. He reminded his audience that if Africa was to retain her independence in a meaningful way, there was need for Africans to unite there and then. There was need for Africans to create one government, Kwame Nukuruma said. There was need to ensure that all the artificial boundaries that had been carved out in Berlin in 1884 were dissolved. There was need to ensure that intra-African trade was enhanced. And there was need for African leaders on that day to remind themselves that however bitter and painful it would be to lose what they described as sovereignty, they had to dissolve sovereignty for the sake of a united Africa. But that was a lonely voice on that day. It was a lonely voice because nobody agreed with Kwame. Even the great Mwalimu Nyerere at that time did not agree with Kwame Nukuruma. He was to say 40 years later that Nukuruma was right and we were wrong. And indeed, when we are gathered here today, we are asking ourselves what it is that we can do to bring to fruition what Nukuruma thought was urgent on that day. Because Nukuruma lost on that day and we came up with an organization known as the Organization of African Unity, whose history you know. It used to be said by some who are not very charitable to the Organization of African Unity that it was a dog that could not bite. But the question is, did it even have teeth? So that when in a few years we as Africans through our leaders recognized that we had to change the name of the Organization of African Unity, we were reminding ourselves that indeed Nkrumah was right and that those who had recognized the mistakes that had been made before, like Malimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, were equally right, that the younger leaders who came a little later, such as Samora Moises Marshall and Agostino Neto, were right, that even younger ones, like Thomas Sankara, were right, so that there is a sense in which today, when we talk about African unity and pan-Africanism, there are those who say that the African problem has been overanalyzed and that therefore we should not analyze it anymore. There are those who say that we know what the problem is and that we should not talk about it anymore. There are those who say that words add to nothing and that we should do nothing anymore. But the truth is that because we did not unite 56 years ago, 
Africa is in a state which sometimes is saddening. Sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking that everything is right. But I want you just this morning for a few moments to do a geographical tour of Africa with me, if only to appreciate that what we think is peace and quiet is a calm that is dangerous. Look at West Africa today. Which of the countries that I'm about to name has not known any pain after our failure to unite? If you look at Sierra Leone, all of us will remember the civil war whose effects are still well today. If you look at Liberia, she may have emerged out of the civil war, but you know that the pain is still there. If you look at Cote d'Ivoire, you can say the same. If you look at the Gambia, even Benin, as I talk now, whether it is Togo or Gabon, and when you come to the Sahelian region, if you talk to the Mauritanians or the Malians or the Central African Republicans or the Chadians or the Bukinabe, we know that there are problems in those countries. If you go up north, those who think that you could solve Libya's problem by killing Muammar al-Gaddafi, now let them go and see what is happening in Libya. If you go to Algeria, if you go to Sudan, you go to South Sudan, you go to Somalia, you go to the Eastern Congo, Africa is not at ease. Perhaps, with the help of hindsight, we can now say, without fear of contradiction, that if we had only listened to Kwame Nkrumah, that if we had only listened to the founding fathers, Africa would be different. But as we sit here today, we know that Africa can be great. We know that Africa should be great. We know that there are many Africans across the world who now recognize that the long-term health of the continent not only demands but requires that we are united. But we also know that Kwame Nkrumah was right. The imperialist is alive and well. The colonialist may have gone, but he is alive and well despite protestation to the contrary. If you doubt it, only ask the Cameroonians how they have continued to manipulate that country even as Africans die. If you doubt it, ask the people of Central African Republic how they have continued to manipulate so much so that we remain the only continent in the world that is still described in linguistic terms. So you will hear the imperialists in the unguarded moment saying Anglophone Africa. But when you go to the so-called Anglophone Africa, not even more than 25% speak French. We are only Anglophone because we were colonized by France, which never left. They never left because even the currency that some countries continue to use is still printed in Paris. They never left, and they don't intend to leave. If you go to the former British colonies, the experience is the same despite protestation to the contrary. I know that the Commonwealth has done many good things, but it was a clever way of ensuring that the countries that had regained their independence were still kept on a short leash so that we were British, we are of the same family. When we are crediting our, are crediting our ambassadors, we don't even call them ambassadors, we call them high commissioners. <laughs> and then we are told when we meet as the Commonwealth that this is a family of equal nations, but that family must at all times be headed by the Queen of England. And when the Queen of England is tired, the son of the Queen of England heads it. That is the reality. How you define equality of nations. 56 years after our leaders met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. 
When you go to the Portuguese, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, Mozambique, even the weak Portugal still thinks that they must dictate to the Africans. And we also are to blame. Sometimes we behave as if our former colonizers have a divine duty to tell us what to do, and as if we too have a, design, a divine duty to accept what they tell us. So we are co-authors of our own misfortune. Samora Moises Marshall, speaking in 1982, said, and I repeat, not verbatim, but in effect, he said, that one of the tragedies of Africa is that sometimes Africans in the unguarded moments even are proud. Those who are colonized by the French say, we were colonized by a better colonizer who has better food and better cuisine. And those who are colonized by the British say, we were colonized by a better colonizer. And you who are colonized by Portugal, one of the weakest and one of the most backward nations in Europe, you are no better than us. And Samora said, how can slaves be saying how good one slave master is better than the other? And I'm submitting to us that that still remains our problem in Africa. When we talk about pan-Africanism, we ourselves stand in the way particularly those of us who have gone to school. Those of us who have gone to school who still think that in order to be intelligent, you must speak English or French or Portugal. Those of us who have gone to school who tell our children that we, uh, we must not speak our mother tongue in this house. Those of us who now think that Mandarin is the next thing that we must begin to speak because China is on the ascendancy. Africa must unite. But Africa is not going to unite because of the number of seminars and symposia that we hold. No, not at all. We have held enough symposia, we have had enough workshops about uniting Africa. But what I begin to see is that the masses of Africa are beginning to rise and making demands of their leaders. Several years ago, I remember one of the greatest speeches ever delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. when he was talking about the civil rights movement and the African Americans were beginning to get tired in the same way that we too sometimes we are beginning to get tired. And that famous speech in which Martin Luther Jr. asked, how long, I'm sure many Africans are asking, for how long shall we wait for this African unity? And his response, not long. And I too believe that we are going to unite as a continent, but we must be able to identify the reasons why we want our unity. Have you ever asked why this continent has always been attractive to other civilizations? What is it that so many years ago, before the white man came into this continent, what is it that the Arab saw? Because the Arab was here. We never talk about it. The very first people to go into the eastern coast of Africa were Arabs. And they enslaved Africans. We never talk about it loudly for purposes of political correctness. What is it that they saw? What is it that the Europeans saw in 1884 that Africa was carved out? What did the Germans want in Namibia? What did they want in Dahomey? What did they want in Rwanda or Rundi? The Germans who are in Germany, why did they want to come here? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever asked yourself why little Portugal wanted Angola? Why they wanted Guinea-Bissau? why they wanted Mozambique, what did they want here? Have you ever asked why the British had to move several thousand miles, that little island, 
to come and take Nigeria and take Sudan and take East Africa and go down south. Have you ever asked what little Belgium wanted in, 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 in the Democratic Republic of Congo or what the Italians wanted in Ethiopia, although they were stopped, or what they wanted in Eritrea or what they wanted in Libya? Have you ever asked? Africa has resources. But African resources have always taken different forms. There was a time when the African himself was a resource. <laughs> there was such a time. And it's not even that that can be talked about in historical terms. As I talk to you now, slavery is back alive and well in Libya. Africans are being enslaved as I talk now and being sold in Libya to Europe, as I talk now. As I talk now, slavery has taken a different form. As I talk now, as I talk now, our minds are not decolonized. That is why 10,000 young men and women die in the Mediterranean Sea every year. We are not counting those who die in the desert. We don't, because we don't know. The question is, how will we solve it when our little countries believe that there is something called sovereignty? When a little country whose GDP is no more than $2 billion also has a president <laughs> with a cabinet, with a parliament, which is bicameral, with embassies all over the world, and the country, the, the president of that country with a GDP of two billion enters into a bilateral meeting with the president of China. <laughs> and you say that all nations are equal. If there was ever a joke, that is one. <laughs> Part of the reason why Africa cannot compete is because Africa is weak. And we are weak because we are divided into 55 odd countries created in Berlin. And we are allowing ourselves to fight amongst ourselves. And as you who are beautiful Kiswahili speakers know and say, Vita vya panzi furaha ya kunguru. <laughs> and that is exactly what is happening today. The the locusts are fighting and the kunguru is ever so happy. They come in and take what they want. And meanwhile, we are left fighting. You tell me, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is easily the wealthiest nation on earth, conservatively it is said that her resources under her belly are in the tune of 34 trillion United States dollars Yet paradoxically and ironically at once, it's one of the poorest nations on earth. We are weak because we are divided. And we are divided by our erstwhile colonizers. I may not have the statistics, but if you go to the former French colonies, you will discover that the French have some detachment of their army inside of those countries. If you go to Burkina Faso, you'll find one. If you go to Niger, you'll find one. If you go to Central African Republic, you'll find one. If you go to Cote d'Ivoire, you'll find one. If you go to Senegal, you'll find one. You go to Benin, you'll find one. You go to Togo, you'll find one. You go to Gabon, you'll find one. When they want to change leaders, they change them like we change underwears. <laughs> the weaker we are, the stronger they are. And until we recognize that we are going nowhere, but we have lamented for too long, we have analyzed for too long, we have moralized for too long. We have intellectualized for too long. We have philosophized for too long. 
we must now ask ourselves what is the action that must be taken. If Africa is to rise and rise in a meaningful way, our young men and women must now begin to rise. And to rise in a creative way. Because we are able to see when our affairs are being run in an improper way. We have seen in northern part of Africa a few years ago when the people recognized that the leaders were not governing well in Tunisia, they rose up. When they recognized that the people were not governing well in Egypt, they rose. Right now they have recognized that the people are not governing well in Algeria, they have risen. In Sudan, they have recognized that the leaders are not governing well. They are rising. Perhaps one of the things that we must do is to awaken our young men and women and to tell them what pan-Africanism means. What is pan-Africanism? What is it? The thing that we keep on talking about, what is it? And my submission is that pan-Africanism will only make sense when the barber in Kariako market here in Dar es Salaam and the market woman in Bangui in the Central African Republic have a common understanding of what Pan-Africanism is. In other words, time has come that we must remove our definitions of Pan-Africanism out of the university lecture theaters and symposia such as this and break it down so that it can be consumed by real people in Africa. It is only then that we are going to make Africa great. It is only then that we are going to make the dream of Kwame Nukuruma come to fruition. But I've been asked to pose and at once answer the question, what are the things that stand in our way toward the realization of Pan-Africanism? And there are many of them. One of them is the state of our mind. It is that great African-American Martin Luther King Jr. who used to say, the mind is the standard of the man. And I can't agree more with him. The mind is the standard of the man. And the Caucasians and progressively the Asians are always ahead of us because they choose to think long term. You know, last year I was watching the Chinese at their meeting of their Politburo, 3,000 or is it 6,000 men in dark suits, talking in eloquent Mandarin. And what they were thinking and talking about is how to deal with the world, including Africa. <laughs> and they were thinking how China will relate to the world 100 years from that date, acutely aware that none of them in that room would be alive in a hundred years' time. In many African capitals, if you ask people to think about five years, they think it is too far. <laughs> they ask you, will I be alive in five years? We Africans sometimes believe that we must plant the tree and enjoy our fruits. No, we cannot. Wisdom has demonstrated not once, not twice, that those who plant the tree must and indeed never eat the fruit. Their joy is in planting the tree, that history may remember them. And I'm submitting to us that we must decolonize our mind. Kenya's Ngugi Wathiongo was right that it is the decolonization of our minds that will be the beginning of our proper appreciation of where we want to go. What do I mean decolonizing the mind? We must recognize that we live in a global world, that we cannot escape. We must recognize that we are going to relate with other civilizations, that we cannot escape. We must recognize that we are going to work with the Chinese, with the English, with the French, with the Americans, with the Indians, and with the Arabs, and that if we do not work smart, they will outsmart us. Because everybody does what is in their best interest. Has Africa defined what is in her best interest? I'm submitting that we have not. If we have, we have defined it very narrowly as Tanzanians. But what is Tanzania 
in the scheme of things? What is the economic power of Tanzania in the scheme of things? At the very best, the GDP of Tanzania last year must be below 50 billion United States dollars. I am quite certain that one of the big boxers in the United States of America can earn that in a year.